Hey, I'm John Devaj with Our Revolution in Colorado Springs. Uh, with me today is Jillian Freeland, who's running for Congressional District 5. Uh, first off, yeah, thank you, Jillian, for being here. Um, I know, yeah, we have to start doing this virtually. I wish I could meet you again in person, but um, just have to make do in these, uh, you know, these current times. Um, I guess my first question is, like, how, how are you uh, doing? Are you, are you doing okay in these, uh, in the pandemic and the lockdown that we're seeing in Colorado? I mean, it's been a lot of adjustments, of course. I have two small kids who are pretty bored being cooped up in the house. And, you know, politicians, typically what we do is go out into the community and shake hands and kiss babies. And that is absolutely not <laughs> a good plan right now. And so we are shifting to a heavily digital program and really embracing technology. And I think it's been pretty amazing the last few weeks how people have kind of taken a crash course in webinars and, and are keeping life moving forward. So I'm really glad that, you know, we have the technology we do right now so that we can stay connected with each other and not um, lose the sense of community because it's really easy to get sad and, and discouraged when you can't speak to people you care about. And, you know, little FaceTime, kids get to see grandma and I get to talk to constituents. And, and uh, so we just, make do and, and keep moving. Yeah, I mean, like, these times, like, you know, the uncertainty and, and just the changes that people have to, you know, do to adapt to, to, these, to the pandemic is just, you know, it's pretty insane. Um, and I can't imagine that being easy at all for someone who's trying to get their name out there, trying to, you know, reach their constituents and really trying to, you know, uh, you know, run, run a campaign. Uh, and I mm -hmm. feel like there's, the, uh, the amount of adaption that needs to happen is just um, kind of mind-boggling and probably unprecedented. So I'm curious about how your campaign is really adapting to that. Um, and really, if there's like any virtual town halls that are coming up or anything that uh, people can listen to to um, kind of get involved with your campaign. Well, we've been trying to embrace the technology in as many ways as possible. And luckily, we have a lot of avenues. And so we're trying to use them all and reach people where they're comfortable. So we've done some Facebook Live videos and we are planning uh, more kind of town hall formats. And we're looking at a, an AMA on Reddit. So uh, ask me anything so people can uh, find us there. There's also Zoom like we're using now and GoToWebinar. And so luckily we have a lot of available technology and people have really impressed me with their desire and willingness to embrace it. And the county convention here in El Paso was a pretty impressive example. We had thousands of volunteer hours into planning an in-person assembly and convention, which is a huge undertaking. And then everything turned upside down and the party and their amazing volunteers were able to turn around and learn how to use the technology. And we had more than 400 people that were on the webinar last Saturday when we took our votes on the US Senate and congressional races and also uh, looked at the party platforms. And so I think we're fortunate to have the amount of technology that we have now. It can help us stay connected um, to, to our voters, but of course, more importantly, to our community. Because, you know, it's really hard when you have family members who are immune compromised. And so, you know, the kids can't go see grandma. That's hard on everybody. And being able to pop on FaceTime and see each other's faces is such a incredible uh, tool that we have and I'm really grateful to have it. Yeah um, and you mentioned the county convention yeah I mean that, that was pretty remarkable how well that ran um, mm -hmm. and I mean you did you did fairly well at the county convention I, I believe. Um, <laughs> I, I did. Uh, I'm curious uh, you know what are your and I'm also curious on uh, your impressions of, of that um, of the results as well as like kind of what the next steps are for um, your campaign because uh, I'm uh, yeah a bit just a bit confused by you know just how that whole process works out because I understand there's still a primary that's going to take place I believe June 30th. Um, kind of. <laughs> um, so you are absolutely right that it's very complicated and uh, this whole process really could use a revamp. I, I, I think that primaries uh, in, in general are more inclusive and easy for people to participate in 
because the caucus assembly and convention process is quite complicated and requires participation on several different dates. And so by making it a primary process, we can, you know, it's kind of a, you get your ballot, you've got your standard three weeks to research the candidates and then boom, we vote. Uh, and so moving forward, at, even with how amazing our, our volunteers were in executing these online meetings and electronic votes, I do think that the way of the future is going to be a primary process instead of caucusing. Um, that being said, I'm really grateful that I've been on the ground for a year with this campaign. Actually, uh, today marks one year since I declared my candidacy. What a, what a great day to do an interview. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think the results at the, the four counties that are reporting shows that I have put in a lot of hard work and that the time I have spent in the community as an activist working on, you know, taking action on climate change and improving our health care, that that translated into a lot of votes. And so uh, I have between 80 and 82 percent of the delegate votes across the four counties that have uh, turned in their results. We're just waiting on Fremont County, but we are confident that the results will be similar. And my my biggest challenger was Ryan Lucas, and he has uh, suspended his campaign. He recognized that the amount of work that I put in over the last year, uh, because he jumped in a, a, a lot later than me relatively, uh, I, I had a big advantage. And, and I really think that the work that I've been putting in is going to translate into a lot of momentum this summer. And I also have had time to build my online presence. And so um, I have a fairly decent Twitter following. If you're not following me, please do. <laughs> Freeland CO5 is my handle everywhere. Um, and that is one of the easiest ways that you can help me get my message out. Uh, and it's free because money's on everybody's mind right now. And uh, the more we can do grassroots, the better. And, and the more it shows community support because, you know, um, incumbents like Doug Lamborn have a lot of steady sources of, of revenue, but they don't have the experience with the grassroots activism and the, the building of community support that, that I and my campaign staff have done over the last year. So uh, I think we've laid the groundwork well. And if, if you could possibly come into a situation like this, being well positioned for a campaign, I think we've managed to do that. So. Yeah. So getting like 80% of the delegates at, you know, these county conventions, like how does that translate for you to get like, are you going to be then the only primary? And so, yeah, the only other person who got any delegates was Ryan Lucas, who has suspended his campaign. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that you are going to be the only person on the primary ballot? So the other two gentlemen have not received any delegates yet. So they will not be on the ballot unless they were to manage at county convention to convince 30% of the delegates to vote for them instead. Um, and I don't... I, uh, by no means do I intend this to be um, bragging or anything, but neither of those gentlemen have received any delegates at this point. So it would be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, for them to garner the support they need. You have to have 30% of delegates to land on that June 30th ballot. And, and so if they do not receive those delegates, then I have no primary opponent which is fortunate because there are a lot of um, entities that don't get involved with campaigns until it's clear who the nominee is going to be. And uh, there are some great organizations <laughs> uh, that are included in that. And uh, we really need their support because it's difficult to fundraise from individuals right now. And you know we've got some really great dedicated regular uh, folks who donate, uh, but we need some of the, the power behind you know, groups like our revolution and, and the organizing capabilities of unions so that we can keep moving forward. Because um, this is a really tough race. It's considered uh, one of the most secure Republican seats. However, Doug has shown a stunning lack of leadership in this last month or so. Um, and, and, you know, he has a history of making really insensitive and racist remarks and he is going all in with this with this COVID outbreak. I mean, just yesterday he was tweeting some, <laughs> he says that COVID spelled out means China originated virus uh, in December, 2019. That is not what it stands for, but he is building propaganda 
And unfortunately, we have seen a rise in hate crimes against Asian folks who are here in our communities, and he is feeding that. That's really irresponsible, and it's definitely not representing his community. And so I think it speaks to a need for not only leadership, but in particular healthcare providers to be in the rooms writing policies, um, because you know there are best practices when it comes to medicine, and we missed a lot of those in in the early days when we could have had a big impact on the spread of this disease. And so now we are struggling to mitigate the impacts. Um, it's And the social distancing is critical and will ultimately reduce the number of lives that we lose, but we are looking at a very significant loss of our loved ones. And so uh, it feels more important than ever for me to get elected and I'm gonna keep pushing. Um, I also have regained the healthcare workforce. Uh, I, was, I was a midwife <laughs> in, my, in my previous life and uh, really, you know, I, I chose that career because I wanted to fight for women's reproductive rights and uh, make sure that when people are giving birth or uh, deciding whether or not they want to, whether that's trying to access contraception or if they need an abortion, that I could be there to um, protect that space so that women um, can make choices about, you know, whether they want to birth in a hospital or a birth center or in their home. Um, you know, if they want to have an epidural or, you know, there are a lot of choices that are involved in women's health care. And I wanted to make sure that that was honored. And so uh, what's the interesting place that we are in now, because in America, the majority of people birth in the hospital. Well, obviously, that's not a healthy space to be in right now. And yep. honestly, we need the providers that work in the hospital to be focused on folks who are in grave mortal danger. And so I rejoined the birth center just doing the grunt work basically so that the providers that are there can expand the number of clients that they take on so that people can birth in an environment that is still very safe and has all of the medical tools that are needed. Um, uh, and so I'm doing laundry and sanitizing doorknobs and, you know, doing, doing that kind of stuff just so I can help out and, uh, make space for more people in the birth center. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, and that's, you know, the several things there. I mean, the, the, the lack of leadership from our current representative is just, it's, it's, it's almost like I, I can't even really put words to it. Just like the, instead of like trying to like rise above the situation instead, uh, instead of, or rise up to the situation to be like a leader in the community, you try to, um, inflame racial tensions is just mm -hmm. it's it's incredibly incredibly insensitive uh, and it's really the last thing that we need and it's not really representative of what you know what yeah what what we as a community need to be focusing on so mm -hmm. that yeah, it is incredibly disheartening that um he's doing that um and you know in contrast to that what you're doing you know sh i think does show leadership in the sense that you're actually trying to do so, do something to actually make it make it easier for our current healthcare um, our, our health providers because I mean yeah those are the people who are really you know on the front lines in the sense um, so mm -hmm. and I'm curious too just like because you do have you know your background in general as a healthcare provider I'm sure it gives you you know a very unique sort of like um, perspective of like this current crisis um, and I know there's been a lot of discussions on you know what should have been done you know few months ago when this was first starting to kind of prop up and I'm kind of curious on what your thoughts are on, in that regard. Well, we had a pandemic response team and their responsibility was to model situations like that, like this that we are currently in and figure out what resources we would need to have and what actions would be responsible to take and how we could execute plans like this. Um, unfortunately, when the Trump administration disbanded that part of our organization, they left us behind in this respect. And um, epidemics, epidemics and pandemics are not a new thing. Uh, we have, you know, in the Obama administration, they dealt with Ebola and the H1N1 uh, virus and did so quite successfully. And um, disbanding that team was a very poor choice and left us without resources and, and leadership that would have been critical. Um, and unfortunately, the Trump administration has not been characterized by 
a willingness to hear from experts. It is more based on who is the most loyal and will always agree with what President Trump says, whether it's correct or not. Uh, and so, you know, I wish we had spent more time doing education and making it clear how critical these stay at home orders are. I am continuing to speak to my loved ones who are still not taking this as seriously as I wish they would. Um, unfortunately, it, sometimes it takes uh, direct experience before people are willing to listen to the guidance of experts through the TV or, or wherever. I mean, uh, my husband's grandmother had a stroke last week. And prior to that, my, my in-laws had still been attending church and doing group functions and everything. And, and we were really concerned. And then when grandma had the stroke and Dylan's dad could not go visit uh, and no one could be in the hospital with her, I think it finally hit home that the situation is very serious. And that following the guidelines that, I mean, especially Governor Polis has been just a fantastic leader through this situation. He is calm. The information that he gives us is accurate and based on evidence, not uh, inflaming tensions or scaring people because we need information in a way that doesn't absolutely terrify people. And when we see, you know, grocery stores that are wiped out or, uh, you know, I, I still, when I, when I, ha the couple of times that I've been to the grocery store in the last few weeks, I look for the toilet paper every time because I know it's a thing right now. And, and I'm very grateful to be a uh, Costco shopper because we were well stocked. <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, there, there are just some very interesting things going on in our communities. I mean, um, the sale of firearms has spiked in the last month. And I actually saw a uh, firearm store on Powers that has a sign out front that says, protect your toilet paper. Um, and I just, that type of feeding fear is not healthy and it's not helping. And so I hope that people will take this time First of all, to wash your hands <laughs> and do a good job, uh, not just, okay, done. I, I have put out a couple tutorials, pop on my, on my page, and you can have a look at how to properly disinfect your kitchen and everything and um, how to wash your hands because that ultimately clean hands and not touching your face are the best things that we can do to stop the spread of this disease. Um, and it looks like we're going to start recommending that people wear some kind of cloth mask when they do go out. And I can tell you that in the birth center, we are all wearing masks all day. Uh, and that is uh, protective of our patients. And uh, what's, what's terrifying is that the supply of personal protective equipment is limited and has been impacted by the shutdowns necessary in China to deal with this outbreak because they are one of the major manufacturers of safety equipment. Um, Kimberly Clark is one of the huge brands manufactured in China. Um, and so I have been making cloth masks. Uh, there was a group here in town that was giving out medical grade fabric that provides the filtration that is necessary. Uh, and so I busted out my sewing machine, another skill that I'm glad to have. And, uh, and just trying to keep the community safe and, and get through this as quickly as possible. Now, that being said, this isn't a two-week problem. We're going to be dealing with this probably for months, and life is going to be impacted for more than a year as, yeah. we, as we try to fight out this virus because we will see peaks and drops and peaks and drops. And doing the social distancing now means, well... I want to talk about this term flattening the curve because I don't yeah. think a lot of people understand what it means. So one of the issues of this disease is that because it is so infectious, the number of cases can rise very steeply, meaning we have a lot of people who need hospitalization at the same time, and we are short on equipment and providers right now. The social distancing slows the spread of the disease. And so while we will probably see a similar number of infections either way, by spreading out the number of infections, we make sure that our facilities can meet the needs of the number of people that are sick at one time. 
And so, so that's, when you hear that term, that's what that means. And that's what we're trying to accomplish with the social distancing. So. Yeah. And that's, ex and that's exactly right too. And I think the other important thing to consider too is by, you know, doing the proper precautions, social distancing, um, wash, washing hands and just eliminating the number of infections overall. I mean, it, the effect of that means that this will take longer to get through our country, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there'll be, you know, there'll be less of a, a steepness in the curve, but that curve will be lower than, yeah, like you said, um, th than what we currently have capacity for in our hospitals. Mm -hmm. But the downside is that it will just take longer for it to work its way through um, our mm -hmm. populace. But again, that's a good thing. We want, we, that's a much better alternative, right? Than mm -hmm. having overloaded hospitals and, um, you know, the catastrophic, catastrophic events that take place with that. I mean, things that we're starting to already see in, um, places like New York and uh, and mm -hmm. other and other really highly dense populated areas, um, mm -hmm. and I you, know, you said earlier about Polis's response as well. Like, I 100 percent agree with that. I think you know putting this lockdown and this sort of like stay at home order um, as early as he did really does. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to be a governor mm -hmm. and to do that because like there's a lot of obviously negative side effects, you know. And you hear all the time about like how much this is hurting the economy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, again, what's the alternative? The alternative is definitely worse. Um, mm -hmm. If we, it means more people being infected, more people ending up in a hospital that already has an, you know, shortages. So um, the other point that you brought up that I thought was, is pretty interesting is, you know, how much I'm seeing people like contributing, like my dad, for instance, is 3d printed, um, face masks for his local cool. hospital uh, nice. is, is, is supplying those and yeah like you, you people sewing um, like face masks as well things mm -hmm. like that um, and you know overall I think the the question is is like why is why is our current like health system not necessarily like seem like it's built for this sort of you know obviously these are kind of unprecedented times but mm -hmm. um, just how quickly it seems like we're already at capacity in certain places um, really, is there like a, a reason on why that, why you think that is that we're seeing that in certain areas of the country? Unfortunately, um, I'm not surprised that in a crisis like this, we're not prepared. Our healthcare system is not strong to begin with. And this is part of why the message of uh, Senator Sanders resonates with people so much because it recognizes that we are not serving people. Uh, and, and one of the biggest ways that we can improve our health outcomes is to focus on prevention and education. And so because we were already behind the curve on that, and because we focus on um, management of illness rather than prevention, we just don't have the infrastructure in place to get something like this under control quickly. We also were already facing a shortage of providers. The nurse to patient ratio is out of control and it results in um, medical errors because nurses are humans. And a lot of times when you've been on a 16 hour shift, you are exhausted. And, and there's a lot of evidence that shows that being tired is just as debilitating as being intoxicated on alcohol. And so when we overwork people, they do not perform at their best potential. And especially as our population ages, we are looking at having more people in need of increased medical care over the coming decades. And having a single payer pool that we all work from will help um, mitigate the costs of caring for our aging population. It's also a great field for people to enter into uh, because it, it does pay a decent wage. I would argue that nurses should be paid more. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, we have to redistribute how we spend our healthcare dollars because as it stands right now, a large portion of our spending goes to administration. Um, because, you know, when you have a practice, uh, for example, the birth center, that they have to spend a lot of time navigating, you know, well, this plan covers this, but not this, and this plan covers this, but not this. And then you've got mistakes. So if, if um, codes are not entered correctly, then things have to be rebuilt. And it just adds a lot of administrative costs and time that providers have to spend. This was one of my biggest frustrations as a provider is that I was spending so much time 
fighting insurance companies that I should have been spending reaching out to new clients so that I could serve more people. Um, and so streamlining the administration side of our healthcare system can also reduce waste. Um, and I can tell you that my, my first child was born in the hospital. And when I received the shockingly high bill <laughs> for me to have pushed out my own baby with no epidural, um, I asked for an itemized bill and I found some really disturbing things. So um, like, for example, they charged me for Pitocin, which is a medication that's used to increase contractions. I did not have Pitocin. That was several hundred dollars that they tried to charge. And if I had not asked for that itemized bill, it would have just gotten paid. Um, it also speaks to our tendency to um, push opioids. Um, and I had, I, I have a seizure disorder that has been controlled by medication for seven years. And um, they would not allow me to take my own prescription out of my own bottle. They had to issue it from the pharmacy and that I understand. That medication was $10 per pill. The nurse convinced me to have a Percocet after the baby was born and they charged me $1. This speaks to our priorities in the way that our pharmaceutical system operates. And um, it just illuminates where there's waste and where there are misplaced priorities. And so by having a healthcare provider in the room making the decisions, I will also guarantee that as we adjust provider reimbursement in the coming years, we make sure that it is at a sustainable level and that you know, doctors have a lot of student loans that they have to make payments on too. And so this is a consideration. You know, when you have a provider who is in debt $500,000, of course they're going to charge as much as they possibly can because they have bills to pay too. And, and so getting a handle on student loans and the cost of education is going to be critical to improving our health system as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the, the, the last thing, too, that I just kind of blows my mind as well is, I mean, the unemployment numbers the last two weeks have been, you know, obviously, mm -hmm. like, record high. You know, yeah. this latest report was 6.6 .6 million people filed for unemployment. That means 6.6 mm -hmm. .6 million people lost their access to their health care that they, or the health, you know, the health insurance that they had uh, previously. So, and there was no choice associated with that. They just, right. you know, they this they they didn't have a choice to not you know to be be fired like they they just it just happened so that means that they need to go to the market and find a new provider and just the complexity that is involved with that just i don't understand why that needs to exist when you know all these other countries um operate on a single payer system and mm -hmm. do so at a much cheaper cost than what we're paying as a country yeah. Um, well, and, and especially to be facing lo losing health insurance when we have a deadly pandemic ripping through our communities. It, um, I did see some polling that people are more favorable to Medicare for All now that we have this situation in front of us and seeing that it's putting people's lives in danger, literally in danger to have their uh, health care connected to their employment because it's not in our control. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the, you know, there's obviously a lot of, you know, plenty of negatives that go along with, you know, this, a crisis like this. Um, but, you know, it's good, I think, and healthy to look at the silver lining that it goes with it as well. Um, and having some, you know, seeing the outpouring of support for our, you know, yes. Medicare providers and really bringing the light, the, you know, dysfunction of some of our current systems uh, and hoping that people will, you know, demand action, demand change, because I mean, mm -hmm. that is what's going to be required to, I think, prevent these sort of things from happening in the future. Mm -hmm. um, well, so that, and we, oh, we have some, we have some major economic rebuilding to do because of this as well. Um, and, you know, looking to history, what we have done in the past, you know, when we were in the throes of the Great Depression, the way that we pulled ourselves out of it was through infrastructure spending and strong social safety nets. And so I am trying to create opportunity out of crisis here. Uh, and we can, we can rebuild our economy by taking action on climate change. 
We can invest in the infrastructure we need to use renewable resources for powering our communities. We can expand public transportation and it, these create good union jobs that pay a decent wage so people can afford to pay their bills. Uh, this, this shouldn't be a discussion we have to have anymore, but every single person deserves to live with dignity and not have to struggle to put food on the table while their CEO buys his fourth yacht. Um, we, this is creating an opportunity for discussion and opening people's minds to concepts that they hadn't considered before. I mean, we have Senator Mitt Romney calling basically for universal basic income, and, mm -hmm. and we have managed to pass a spending bill that basically accomplishes that on a temporary basis. Um, this isn't a long-term fix. It'll help people pay the bills while we figure out how we're going to basically reorganize our economy in the face of this crisis. And so hopefully we can use this to create positive change going forward. Um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes it takes some adversity to be open to change. So we can rally, we can, we can come together, we can get this done, um, but it's just gonna take, putting aside some of the partisan nastiness that we have all sunk into and showing leadership. And I know that that's uncomfortable for some people, uh, but yeah, you know, if they're not willing to do the work, I am. <laughs> uh, so with that, I just wanted to end um, with a you know quick discussion, just like you know everyone's you know kind of cooped up and trying to find ways to adapt uh, and stay positive in, in these kind of um, you know potentially dark times. I'm, I'm curious, like what uh, you, what you are doing personally to you know kind of um, you know pass time with your family and um, kind of stay stay positive. We are so grateful for YouTube. There is so much content out there, whether it's, you know, creative projects you can do. Um, I like to dance a lot. And so we have some dance parties in the living room. There are a lot of like dance studios that put out tutorials. And so my, my little four-year-old and I, we get in front of the TV and shake our booties a little bit. And, you know, it's real hard to dance and not smile. And there's a lot of data that shows that actually putting a smile on your face within five minutes improves your mood. And so um, doing something that makes you smile even for five minutes can improve your outlook on the entire day. And of course, exercise is critical. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to, you know, start doing P90X or, you know, something intense, crazy like that. But it is important to get up and move your body and, uh, and protect your mental health that way. And of course, you know, this is a, a weird space to be in, but extroverts are the ones that are struggling with this the most. So if you have a friend that you know they thrive by being out in the community, call and check in on them, you know, um, because I, I've had several friends that have reached out that are struggling. And, and so just support each other. Just keep bringing that community together and, and uh, we will get through this. It's just gonna take time. Yeah, that's per perfect message. Um, yeah, so anyway, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Um, stay safe, stay My healthy. Pleasure. Yes, um, wash your hands. Wash your hands, <laughs> social distance. Um, yeah, and again, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys for the work you're doing because um, these, these kind of uh, video conferences and things like that, that's how we get the word out. That's how we yeah. cause social change. That's how we get, get things done. Yep, thank you again. Yep. Yeah.